My message actually is a positive one. That is, at least from where I sit, the very idea that something might save us from ourselves is a positive idea. What I would like to do is, is to spend our time together not shocking you with all of the shocking details about Trump, but rather contemplating with you how we've gotten to where we are and considering how we think about our moment and how we might think about our moment such that we would have um, better chances in, in the immediate future. So I, I, I'm not going to start by saying that Trump has never said anything positive about democracy or by saying that he never speaks about rights or by pointing out that everyone he admires is an authoritarian or by noticing that he's disobeyed the law his entire life or by pointing out that he has no experience in democratic politics or by noting that he summons his wait or by noting that he summons his followers to violence or noting that he called upon people to assassinate his rival and that we don't even know most of the things we need to know, which may be the darkest thing. I'm not going to start with that. Um, we, we, the, uh, uh, yeah, it was a joke, but in a way I mean it seriously. We, we've built up an appetite for shock, and that appetite for shock is one of the things which leads us towards authoritarianism. That, that desire to be surprised and to have each surprise be greater than the previous surprise is something which leads us away from a liberal order into something else. Because the only people who can supply us with those ever greater shocks are the strong men who blow things up in their own countries or start wars for no particular reason. If we want to get off the track that we're on, we have to lose that appetite for being shocked. We have to take a step back, which you still have a little time to do. We have to take a step back and consider our moment. So I have the luxury as, as a historian that I'm allowed to step back, and I'm going to step back just a little bit with you, and, and I hope you find it interesting. So our own moment, where, how did we get to where we are? Or to put it a different way, what, what happened to history? This idea um, from 1989, 1990, 1991, this idea that history ended now seems to me to be, in fact, has seemed to me for quite a while to be an extraordinarily dangerous fiction. Um, the idea that history is over has stultified our imaginations, it's narrowed our horizons, and it's made us defenseless before the dangers which, if we had some history, we would be much better at recognizing. What do I mean when I say we've accepted that history is over? Um, we've accepted that there are no alternatives in large measure. Um, we've taken on, at least many Americans have taken on, the, the, the fully idiotic idea that, that everything leads to capitalism and capitalism must lead to democracy. Here in Europe, um, people have taken on the, the, the equally crazy idea that the European Union um, is inevitable, that the European Union will inevitably be attractive. We have these two, we've had these two parallel stories about how things will always get better or at least always remain the same. And in this story about the end of history, everything which doesn't fit becomes a divergence. It becomes a failure of a pattern. And let me start just by marking Russia. If we believe that, you know, if we believe either of these stories, that, that we must always move forward towards liberal democracy or that we must always move forward towards Europe, then Russia becomes nothing other than some kind of exception, some sort of failed transition, something which doesn't seem to be going along the correct road. But this is not the right way to think about Russia at all. Um, a, a, a country which, a European country which invades its neighbor which destroys the entire European order, um, which seeks to disrupt and destroy the European Union, which successfully intervenes in American presidential elections, that's not, a, that's not some kind of exception or some kind of failed transition. It's an alternative. It's something else. It's something out there, something which may yet await us and in fact is right in front of us.
But who, who, who are we? Okay, where, where are we? Let me now spend a little bit of time talking about this problem, as I see it, this problem of the politics of inevitability. That's what I'm, that's what I'm going to call the last 25 years in the West, the, the politics of inevitability, um, the idea that things must go in a certain way. There is a European variant and there is an American variant. Now, the European variant is going to seem very strange to you. And I think the reason why it's going to seem strange is because it's true. That is, what I'm going to try to do is to peel off certain layers of things that you think and take for granted um, to try to expose something which is very simple, but which almost no one on this continent or in Great Britain act actually sees. The, the version of European politics of inevitability is that the nation is always there for you, okay? Now, let me try to tell you, let me try to explain as briefly as I can why I think this is an utterly dangerous fiction and why that it's leading you to sleepwalk off the abyss. Um, if, if you look at the history of Europe for just one moment, one thing that you'll notice is that the nation state is much talked about as an aspiration, but it's not really present as a reality. The main pattern of European history in the 20th century, and this is the kind of generalization that I, you know, I get fired for if I were giving a lecture in a classroom, but the main pattern of European history in the 20th century has nothing to do or very little to do with the nation state. It has to do with the transition from empire to integration. And in that transition, the nation state is something that you talk about precisely because it's not real. The nation state is that thing that you assure yourselves is going on while something else is in fact going on. Let me try to be more specific. The, the meaning of the First World War is the end of the major land empires, Romanov, Hohenzollern, Habsburg, Alt Ottoman, right? That does lead to the creation of nation states. And all of those nation states, all of them, all of the nation states that are created from those empires fail in dramatic fashion um, and in ways which lead to the Second World War. In the First World War, the winners, just by chance, are all maritime empires. Great Britain, France, the United States. And those maritime empires survive until the Second World War. What is the meaning of the Second World War? The meaning of the Second World War is the end of empire in Europe in general. It's the end of the Nazi attempt to establish an, if you like, African-style uh, empire in Eastern Europe. The aim of the war, the war had very little to do with Western Europe, right? The aim of the war, the German war aim, was to conquer East European lands and to create a colonial empire. So the meaning, the broad meaning of the Second World War in Europe is the final failure of that kind of empire. In the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the other European empires, the maritime empires, also fail. The Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the British, the French, right? They, they all fail, the Belgian. One, one way or another, they, they all fail. And as they fail, you all bracket the history of empire away, talk about the nation state, and imagine that a nation state has joined Europe. But nothing ever happened like that. There was never actually a moment when you were a nation state. And I mean you, the Netherlands, but I also mean you, Europe, Europe in general. I'm happy to make an exception for Finland, if there are any Finns here, um, you know, or Luxembourg. But for, for, for for you Europeans in general, and for you Dutch in particular, it never happened that you had a nation state which chose to join Europe. You had an empire which fell apart in a series of increasingly bloody wars, and then you got to join a European integration process as, a, as an economic and political, and for that matter, moral substitute for that lost empire. What do I mean by moral substitute? Here's what I mean. There is a story that you tell us with um, with stultifying regularity, and that, that's you Europeans tell us Americans, with stultifying regularity, which is entirely untrue. And that story is that you learned about peace from the Second World War. 
There's no truth in that. The European peoples who suffered the most in the Second World War were the Jews, the Poles, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, the Russians. Those people did not learn peace from the Second World War. You might say, oh, well, we West Europeans, we're the wise ones. But you didn't learn peace from the Second World War either. You kept fighting wars in Africa and in Asia until you lost them decisively enough that you came back to Europe, at which point you started talking about how you learned a lesson from the Second World War. Right? And that is the story that you tell yourselves. And as an, as an external consequence of that, you tell it to us. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that this is a myth which is all fine and good so long as you're not facing any major challenges. It's, it's all well and good to have this story. It's a bit just, I think now it's rather important to realize that it's totally false. Why? Because, not because I don't like peace, I like peace too. You know, we all like peace. But because if you don't see your own history, you see alternatives that don't exist, right? So the, 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 the European version of the politics of inevitability is that the nation is always there making choices um, and that therefore um, the nation can make another choice. So let me try to be as clear about this as I can. I'll return to it later. If you think the nation was always there and it just chose empire, it didn't choose empire, it was empire, or it chose integration, it didn't choose integration, it was integration. If you think the nation was there making choices, you can think, well, we can choose to leave the European Union. But you can't, because you don't exist without it. There's no, you, there is no historical evidence that any of your nations, and I include Germany in this, is actually self-sufficient without some larger project, right? Because you've never had that experience. Insofar as there is historical evidence, it all points in the other direction. In other words, this fantasy that the European Union is something one can simply exit, that is not based on tradition. It's not based on the past. It is a pure invention, right? And therefore, it's a walk into the abyss. Now, that, the, the reason why this is, you know, I'm stressing this as the politics of inevitability because it suggests that there's something which has to happen, that the nation just has to go on, right? But it doesn't have to. The Netherlands don't have to go on. You haven't, it hasn't been around for that, time, for that long. It doesn't have to go on. It's not clear whether you exist without the European Union, right? Nervous laughter. It's not clear that you exist without the European Union, right? Um, OK, what's the American version? The American version is probably more familiar to you, right? Because it's, the logic is, it's very hard to understand oneself. And it's very easy to you know, make fun of people on the other side of the Atlantic, as I've just done a little bit. Um, although, I mean, I mean it very seriously. This is your problem. You think, that you, have, you think you have a history of nation states that you can go back to, and you don't. And that is, in fact, a big problem, right? It's like you, know, you think you have a twin, so you can commit suicide. But you know, it doesn't actually make any sense to commit suicide just because you have a twin, when you, especially when you don't have a twin. OK. Um, what's, what's, what's the American version of this? As I say, this will sound, this will sound more familiar. Um, the, the American version of this is the idea that all you have to do is remove various kinds of clutter um, regulatory clutter, historical clutter, and liberal democracy will triumph. So the American understanding of 1989, which is entirely wrong, is that communism simply collapsed and therefore liberal democracy naturally emerged. Um, of course, this is not the case. Liberal democracy emerged insofar as there were civil societies and also in large measure insofar as there was a European Union to set an example of the rule of law. Let me give you a couple of other examples, which at first glance seem contradictory, but which confirm this larger pattern. One is the American invasion of Iraq in 2003 under a Bush administration. The idea of invading Iraq was all we have to do is get rid of the bad thing, get rid of the bad leader, get rid of the bad regime, get rid of the bad political party, get rid of the bad army, get rid of all these bad things, and then liberal democracy would spring upwards, as it were, from, from the desert, right? It sounds ridiculous when I put it that way, but that, that was essentially the plan, 
right? That, that was the notion. And it's based upon this logic of inevitability, that liberal democracy is the way that history must go, and sometimes, sometimes you have to move some things out of the road, but then inevitably things will go forward. Now, if we move forward a decade to a different leader in a different situation, we see very much the same logic. Consider how the Obama administration reacted to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which, if one thinks about it for just a moment, is a rather terrifying thing. It's a disruption of the European order, right? It's an event which people said would never happen, that one European state would invade another European state, take its territory, rather shocking thing. Um, but the American reaction, the dominant American reaction was, the Russians just don't understand history. They don't understand that this makes no economic sense. This is irrational. History will prove them wrong. In the long term, this won't matter. You know, or the worst, Russia is just a regional power. Now, th this, this is fundamentally the same mistake that the Bush people made, right? This notion that history somehow, there are forces of history that they're on your side um, and that all you have to do is make a few adjustments and everything will turn out the right way. Um, in fact, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is just act one in the Russian attempt to destabilize the European Union, which was just act one in the Russian attempt to destabilize the West, right, which we are still living through, or I am still living through as an American citizen, since they just got their candidate elected. Um, now, that's not, there's no, that wasn't a joke, actually. Um, so, um, the, so let me summarize then. Although these versions of the politics of inevitability are a little different, they have led all of us to certain, I think, false or at least very limited ways of imagining politics. So take this whole notion that there is no alternative, right? There is no alternative. Or as two political philosophers who recently sadly died, Zygmunt Bauman and Leonidas Donskis called it, Tina or, or, or liquid evil, there is no alternative, right? That only seems plausible when you think you're in a path of inevitability. Or, on the other hand, consider how we try to criticize our reality. Consider um, the use of the word neoliberalism, which, you know, every time I hear it, it just makes me sad. Not because I like neoliberalism, I don't, but because almost always when people on the left talk about neoliberalism, what they mean is this all-powerful overcoming conspiratorial octopus against which we can do nothing except say the word neoliberalism, right? <laughs> which, is, which is not actually criticism. It is in fact submission, right? Neo, the word neoliberalism is a kind of, kind of, has become a kind of incantation which means we actually can't do anything. Right? Except, you know, except perhaps you know, something in culture. We can't do anything. Or consider another, another term which makes me actually sick every time I hear it, disruption. Right? The idea of disruption, we're going to disrupt, which is unbelievably childish. Because first of all, um, disruption is not a plan. Right? It's just a, a mess. And secondly, the whole idea of disruption assumes that the system always bounces back. A disruption is just something which causes a momentary problem. You're, when you say disruption, you're assuming that the system has some kind of inevitable power to bounce back from whatever you do. So why not vote for Brexit? Or why not vote for Trump? The system will survive no matter what you do, right? But it won't, is the funny thing. It won't. This whole idea of disruption has been very, very unhealthy for us and counterproductive. Um, another, another example of the way we've learned to criticize is to think in terms of post-catastrophe, right? The entire popular culture is organized around post-catastrophe. We don't think about what the catastrophe actually will be. We certainly don't realize that we're to blame for it. We just imagine the next step, right? After some catastrophe, then there's going to be a nice Hollywood movie, right? There's going to be a Hollywood movie about post-catastrophe. But we don't think about the catastrophes that we're actually facing or, or, or causing. Anyway, the, there may be other modes of criticism that I missed. I'm sure there are. But my basic point is that our very modes of criticism have been captured by this idea of in inevitability and in a way have become part of this idea of inevitability. And that just makes us all the more vulnerable. OK, so the point, here's the point about vulnerability. If you accept some kind of politics of inevitability, 
whether as an unthinking advocate or as a critic, if you accept the politics of inevitability, you're making yourself very vulnerable to another form of time or another form of thinking about time, which I'm going to call the politics of eternity. Um, and you know, you're making yourself vulnerable because first of all, all of these things turn out not to be true, right? There is an alternative. You don't have to have democracy. You can have fascism. You don't have to have neoliberalism. You can have protectionism. Um, you don't have to have disruption. You can try to disrupt and get destruction instead. You don't have to have post-catastrophe. Post you can have real catastrophe, right? There is an alternative. All of the ways we've been thinking about the world have basically been disproved in the last year or so. Um, and in the shock of all of this, you know, my, my concern is that we move from one false way of thinking about time, that we're here and we have to go here, things have to go better, to another false way of thinking about time. Namely, we're here and things just can't change at all. This is just the way the world is. There's nothing we can do about it. That this will collapse into this. Okay, so what is this? Um, the second way of thinking about time, which is creeping up on us, which is sleeping in, which is slipping into the way that we speak um, and 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 talk and think, um, is what I would call the politics of eternity. The politics of eternity, like the politics of inevitability, it seems to be historical. That is, it has something to say about the past and the future, but it's actually another way of not thinking about history. Um, and here, you know, this is here is an example of how Russia is actually an extremely interesting place. Um, that Russia is a place which is actually ahead of the curve in a lot of things. Um, if you look at the political philosophy of the Russian leadership, you have a very interesting example of a president, um, Vladimir Putin, who has rehabilitated a particular fascist thinker of the 1930s, a man called Ivan Ilin. Um, and, you know, it, it, you, I wouldn't want to overstate the case, but in a very interesting way has brought Eileen's ideas into life. Now, I'm going to use Eileen as an example. Not that he's the only thinker that matters in Russia or in the West, but I think he probably he may matter more than any others right now. So let me give you a sense of what his idea of time is, because it's, it's rather different from what, what we're used to. Um, he doesn't believe that there is any notion of history or progress that's possible, Eileen's version of the world is, is, goes like this. And I'm, I, I will now admit that I'm simplifying you know, 40 books into about 10 sentences. Um, but I think I can do so without too much violence. Um, so what Eileen says is that when God created the world, he made a mistake. The, the, the world that he created, because it's contingent, it's full of accidents, is sinful and inherently evil. God essentially committed suicide by creating the world. He extinguished the thing which was good about himself, which was absolute truth. Um, absolute truth survives only one place in our damaged, horrible, chaotic, accidental world, and that is in Russia. Um, and and this, is where, no, this is where it gets really interesting. It survives in Russia despite what Russia appears to be. Because remember, facts themselves are evil. Facts are evidence of the contingent, accidental, imperfect character of the world. So it might seem to you that the facts of Russia suggest something, but that doesn't matter. What's true is the deep, invisible um, goodness of Russia itself. Now, from this line of reasoning springs an interesting way of thinking about time, which is this. Russia, as good, has always defended the West from evil. The West has always been ungrateful and therefore attacked Russia. Therefore, the whole story of Russia is a cycle. It's a cycle of vulnerability and attack from the West. And whatever might seem to be happening, this is in fact the deeper reality of what is happening. Now, I, I understand that there are all kinds of complications, right? I understand that there are in fact, despite what Eileen says, there are many contingencies, right? There are many details. But in general, this way of seeing time is consistent with a new form of Russian policy, which has been very instructive and I think very effective. Um, so if you could think back to 2011, 2012, when um, Russian parliamentary and presidential elections were held and faked, um, the, the Russian leadership came up with two basic ideas, interesting ideas. The first was that Hillary Clinton was personally responsible for the protests that surrounded um, the faking of the elections. 
And the second interesting idea was that the European Union was attempting to spread its false ideas into Russia. Right? There were a lot of other ideas, but I'm going to stay with two. Now, why are these so consequential? Because it redefines, just as Aileen actually redefined, what democracy is. Democracy is nothing more than a form of vulnerability to the outside world. And the true form of politics is the protection of this ineffable, you know, whatever it is, Russian virtue. Now, that flowed very naturally um, into the politics of virtue that Russia applied when invading Ukraine. The logic of invading Ukraine was Ukraine should not belong to the European Union, but to the Eurasian Union. And the attractive thing about the Eurasian Union is that you don't have to carry out any reforms to join it. In fact, on the contrary, if you carry out reforms, you cannot join it. The definition of the Eurasian Union was all in terms of virtue, right? Um, and once politics is defined in terms of virtue, then it doesn't matter that you have a kleptocratic, corrupt, authoritarian regime. What matters is whether you're fundamentally good or not. And so when Ukrainians thought that they were trying to join the European Union, from the point of view of this kind of politics, they were just joining in Europe's senseless, eternal attack on Russia. Now, it, this might sound strange, but this is how, in fact, it was presented. And this is how I think, you know, those of you who are from Russia can confirm this is how many Russians understand the events. That this, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a defensive action against what Eileen liked to call a spiritual attack on Russia. Um, and the spirit in the attack, the military attack, which was meant to be a spiritual defense, the military attack was, was presented precisely in terms of defense, defense of virtue, mainly virtue against homosexuality. Okay, that's to a striking extent, that was all, I mean, Ukrainians were presented as a gay avant-garde, which is just a very strange idea. Um, and, and Russia was present, Russia was defending itself from the gay avant-garde. Um, I mean, the whole idea of Ukraine is the spear point of world homosexuality is, you know, an extraordinary one, but that was used. The other, oh, it was, but it was European homosexuality, by the way, which the Ukrainians were, you know, somehow become vulnerable to. The other one was the Nazi business, right? That the West are Nazis, the, the Americans are Nazis, the Ukrainians are Nazis, there was a Nazi coup. There are a lot of things to say about this. It was a very early example, from our point, from our point of view anyway, of, of post-factuality, right? It is a claim which has you know, very little resemblance to reality. Ukraine has a much smaller far right than, I mean, I don't mean to be mean, but you, or France, or Austria, or Britain, or the United States, right? There are, in fact, there are very few countries in the West where the far right is less important than it is in Ukraine. And of course, Russia, the country making this accusation, was governed by a far right regime when it was making this accusation. So it was an early example of post-factuality. Um, it's also, you know, a, a very good, a very good example of something we've now come, become more familiar with, which is dist distracting propaganda. So, if you say you're fighting Nazis, then the Western press spends its six months talking about whether or not you're fighting Nazis instead of covering what's actually happening. You know, which is a pretty straightforward Russian invasion of, 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 of part of Ukraine. But what I want to get at here is the way that it's it works with this different concept of time, with the politics of eternity, because you see. The idea that Russia is fighting Nazis in Ukraine means that not just Russia is on the defensive, it means that the same thing is happening over and over and over again, right? The idea that these are Nazis means that we are still in 1941. Now, I don't actually mean this as any kind of poetic exaggeration. The 18-year-old the boys who are, who, are, who are driving Russian tanks into Ukraine not the children, not the grandchildren, but the great-grandchildren of Red Army soldiers are painting World War II era slogans, right? Like, for example, for Stalin on their tanks. They are in a way which is quite literal, living or thinking they're living in that moment, right? I mean, perhaps the most dramatic example would be when some separatists in Ukraine broke into a historical museum claiming that they were going to take a tank off of a pedestal in the museum, right, and use it on the battlefield, um, which which I think they failed to do. But it gives you an idea. It's a serious. It's a serious of an alternative notion of time, 
where the same thing happens over and over and over again. And this, the reason this is, all, this is so important um, is that it, well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of them is that it means that politics becomes permanent emergency. How can you think about the future when we're always being drawn back into the past? How can you dare think of reform when our enemies are always at the gates? How could you challenge our leader when he is the only hope we have against this eternal offensive, right? That, that's, that's the way the politics of eternity works in everyday politics. <clears throat> now, of course, there's something which is interesting for Europeans here too. If you'll just accept what I said for a moment about the European idea that the nation is always there and has a choice, the Russian invasion of Ukraine showed that wasn't true, right? It showed that Ukraine was a nation state, right? And it tried to make a choice and it got invaded. So if Europeans had realized like that, that this was their myth, then this would have been a moment when that myth was challenged. But you know, neither of those things really happened. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the perhaps just as interesting is the particular reference back to the Second World War um, as, a, as a positive moment. Now you might be wondering, like, what could possibly be wrong about you know re reliving 1941? Um, and the, the the problem is that it didn't stop in 1941. That um, that that Russian intellectuals and then Russian law started to defend 1940 and then 1939, which is the, the moment of the Hitler-Stalin pact, right? Which, if in case you missed it, Vladimir Putin has repeatedly defended as a good idea. And in turn, the move back to the 1930s then turns out to be something which is rather contagious, okay? Um, and here we have the moment where the politics of inevitability meets the politics of eternity, the 1930s, or the revival of the 1930s. Your myth about how the nation is always there, right, um, means that you think you can take the nation and do something else with it. You can take it in, it's like a car. You can park it in the European garage, you can take it out of the European garage. But the truth is you built that car in that garage and it doesn't have an engine, right? Um, <laughs> it's on blocks, right? Um, so, the, the, but this, so you have this idea from your politics of eternity that there's a nation, you can kind of do stuff with it. In, out, in, out have an election in, have a referendum out, in, out. That's your myth, right? The politics of eternity comes along and says, hey, the 1930s weren't so bad. 1930s are all right. Nothing was really wrong with the 1930s. And if you think about it for just a moment, you'll see that across a whole range of European, and I'll get to America too, European examples, the 1930s are coming back. Um, if, if you consider Poland, right? Poland um, is now in a place where there can be a major book of historical fiction which says that the problem with the Second World War was that we were fighting on the wrong side, that we should have been fighting on the Nazi side. Now, that, I mean, that might seem sort of striking on its own right, but I would point to something else. The, the, the underlying, mis okay, there's a huge moral problem with that, obviously, right? But there's also a political misunderstanding, which is to say the, Pol the Polish nation state was just fine. We just made a mistake. And once you say that, you're overlooking the basic issue, which is that the Polish state, although it did many interesting and remarkable things in the 20s and 30s, had fundamental structural problems in 1939. That's the thing that gets overlooked. Um, but not, not to just pick on the East Europeans, consider the Front National, right? The Front National, the whole basic ideology of the Front National in France is the notion that there was a moment when France was separate from the world and that we should return to that moment, right? Now, you know, right, there was no such moment. There was a French empire and then there was a France that joined the European integration process. The, the, the nostalgic moment of going back to the 1930s, look, the real French 1930s were bad enough, right? Going back to them um, is even in a way worse because there's no, no one has, is realizing that this is a moment which turned out to be untenable. And again, with France, it's a bit like Poland, right? It's not just that France couldn't defend itself against Germany, right? Both France and Poland lasted for about five or six weeks. It's that that defeat 
as Mark Bloch understood, that defeat indicated a basic failure, right, with the state itself. It wasn't just a military defeat, it was, it was, a, it was a political collapse in both cases. Great Britain, what is, the, what is the idea of Brexit based upon, right? The idea of Brexit is based upon the notion that there is a British state, that there's British history. There is no British history in that sense. It, it just, it never happened. Right? I mean, admittedly, you know, what British schoolboys learned is Greece, Rome, you know, the Victorian period, Hitler. And with that, you know, with that scheme, it's easy to see how certain things might go missing. But one of the things which has gone missing is that Britain only has imperial history and then the history of integration. Right? It doesn't actually have any other modern history any more than you do, for that matter. Right? And the, the issue here, I'm sure you see it, is that when you vote for Brexit, what are you exactly voting for? The language is all nostalgic. We're going to go back to something. But there, that, that, that back to just doesn't, doesn't exist. It was never, it was never there. Right? There's an entire consensus, and, this, and the British are very good Europeans in this sense. There's, an, there's a consensus in Britain, as there is in Europe, that there's a nation to which one can go back. But it was never there. There was no nation state there. And so Brexit, you know, like other fantasies, be they French or Dutch, about leaving Europe, this is sleepwalking towards an abyss, right? With a blindfold on. There's, there's, there's nothing there, right? Or whatever is there, you don't know what it is. And all the reassuring talk about the past is just there to confuse you further. Okay, I promised I would talk about the United States, and I, and I will. Um, so what was the, so what about the United States? The same basic pattern. The politics of inevitability gives way to the politics of eternity. And in our case, it's extraordinarily brutal and rapid, right? If you, if you want to consider the basic problem of the Clinton campaign, and there were many, right? But the basic problem of the Clinton campaign is that it was based upon this story that everything is getting better for everyone and it must do so, right? And that basic story, which is true for a lot of Americans, it's true for you know, the people immediately around Hillary Clinton, um, it, it was not true for everybody. And moreover, as a story, it was a bit alienating for, for a lot of people, right? But she, you know, and, and it's hard to overstate the degree to which she and the, the top of the Democratic Party were in a bubble, li living in a story, a story that had a plot. Right? But life is not a story with a plot. Right? Life is not a story with a plot. And, she, and, and when she loses and Trump wins, you know, what we have are um, as a dramatic and rapid transition from, the, from inevitability to eternity. Right? Um, the, 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 the Trump vision of the United States is strikingly similar to European nostalgia, explicit or implicit, for, for the 1930s. Um, you know, Trump's idea, as he said explicitly in 2014, is that you have to make economic conditions or inequality so bad that you have riots, and then you get a sorting out of classes and races, and thanks to violence, you then have a renewal. It's a terrifying vision, but it's a vision that was rather popular in the 1930s. Trump's chief political advisor, a man called Stephen Bannon, um, promises us a return to... Um, which one? He's that guy right there. We don't want the folder. That's him. That's Bannon. Um, the, um, this is a bad American political habit, right? Now I'm pointing people out of a crowd. It's him, right? Um, uh, see, we're all, we're all in decline. Um, uh, the, the Bannon you know, promises us, quite literally, a return to the pol policies of the 1930s, which he characterizes as exciting. Right? The excitement of the 19... And yes, the 1930s were certainly exciting. They were, they were other things as well. And as, and, as, and as you might have noticed, if you were able to watch Trump's you know, very short inauguration address, what was the main theme? In, I mean, in English, those American English, that phrase, America first, is very significant, right? America first was the name of a committee of businessmen, politicians, some entertainers, one aviator, um, which, was, which was trying to keep the United States out of the Second World War, and which incidentally opposed the welfare state. Now, here actually is the key to everything. Um, the, the, what the group around Trump imagined is that the United States made a wrong turn 
two wrong turns in the 1930s, towards the welfare state and towards intervention in Europe. And now what we're going to do is go back to the 1930s and we're going to correct those mistakes. We're going to, get away, we're going to do away with the welfare state, such as it is, and we're going to pull back the United States from its foreign commitments. That's the idea, right? And so, you know, one might think that those things that happened in our real 1930s were good. But if you think what needs to happen in the U.S. is cleansing violence, then, you know, anti-fascism and the welfare state are a bad thing. Okay, so before I close with how history might actually be useful, let me just say, make a general point, which I think applies to, to all of us, about how inevitability slips into eternity. I mean, I've, I've tried to give you concrete examples. Russia first. Um, I don't mean that in the normative way, right? That's not, that's not meant as a slogan. I just meant I talked about Russia first. Ru <laughs> Ru Russia, Russia first. I feel like I'm contributing now to like, the forces I'm trying to oppose. Russia first, Europe second, and then America third, right? Um, I've given you practical examples of how this shift has happened, but let me try to make a kind of a more universal uh, case. It's, 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 it's pretty easy to see how thinking in terms of inevitability can become thinking in terms of, 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 of eternity, right? If you believe that everything must always move forward to something, then it's pretty easy to just slip and say, well, okay, nothing must move forward to anything. Because this is one anti-historical view to another anti-historical view. If you think that history is a line this way, it's pretty easy to think then that history is a line that way. Um, if you think that all you need to do is disrupt stuff, then you know once it turns out you've destroyed everything, it's very unlikely that you will recognize your mistake, right? Um, if you think uh, if, if if you think that. Um, if you think, whether as a critic or as a supporter, that things really are inevitable, you've basically deprived yourself of all of your intellectual defenses to the things that actually happen in history itself. Okay, which finally brings me, which brings me to where I should close, which is, can, can history save us from ourselves? And the answer to this is yes, I think it can. I have, I'm not at all sure that it will, but I think it, I think it can help us. Um, of course, that depends upon us taking it seriously, right? It depends on us breaking out of these various illusions instead of switching from one to, to another. But I think history can help us, and very briefly I'm going to tell you how, and maybe we can talk more about it in questions. The first is that history, I mean, as the exercise of looking for facts and patterns, as the habit of believing that you know, one thing comes before another thing and knowing chronology, history can work against both of these views, right? These are both views of thinking about time. Both of them are impossible if you think historically, right? If you think historically, you know perfectly well that nothing is inevitable. You also know perfectly well that nothing is, 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 is actually cyclical, right? If you think historically, you know these things are wrong. Or more importantly, if you think historically, as I hope I've shown in this lecture, you can put both of these things in perspective. You can say, aha, okay, this is, oh, this is the way I think but it's a historically contingent way of thinking. I could think some different way, right? History gives you a defense against these, these views. It, it gives you a sense of what you yourself can do. The other thing that history can do, or another thing history can do, is that it can, great, it can grant perspective on the large sweep of history itself. So where are we now? We are in the, Christ, we are in the crisis of the second globalization. The second globalization. Right? The thing about globalization, it's, I mean, it's like, a, it's like a car wash. You know, you go through it and you think you're going through it. It's like the car is new, but that was a terrible comparison. <laughs> but, the, the, but the idea is that each globalization thinks it's the only globalization, right? I mean, just like each generation thinks it invents sex, okay? Each, each globalization thinks that it's the only globalization. So when we have our globalization, we talk about how everything's new, everything's changed, you know, everything's shiny. We already had a globalization. Just like ours started in the 1970s, the first one started in the 1870s. Just like ours was accompanied by optimism, theirs was accompanied by optimism. Just like ours involved the rise of certain kinds of liberal homogenizing ideas, 
there has involved the rise of certain liberal homogenizing ideas. And just like ours has reached a point of crisis, theirs also reached a point of crisis, right? And that crisis of globalization are those things which we call the First World War, the rise of fascism, the rise of communism, the Second World War. That was the crisis of the first globalization. Now, I don't say that to say it has to repeat. I say that to, I say that to give perspective and a certain kind of firm, if, if, if rather grim, hope. If one knows that globalization can go both ways, then one has a certain basis upon which to imagine, first of all, to know what things can go wrong and not be surprised, right? Because the, 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 where we are now is shockingly bad, but it, 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 it can, and in some cases, the American case, for example, certainly will get much worse before it gets better. We have to know that that's possible, that that's normal, because it already happened. But we also have to know that you can change paths, right? The globalization crisis is a moment which has many possibilities within it and in a certain amount of, of, of choice. Um, which, um, which, which, which brings me to some of the specific lessons um, of the past. I mean, there, there are a lot of things I think we can bring out of, of the 20th century that are immediately helpful. I'll just mention a, a couple of them. Um, but, but, but one of them, you know, is, let me start with this one. One of them is that some of the things that seem new are actually old, and if we recognize them for what they once were, then we're less impressed by them and better, better able to defend ourselves. So let me give the example of post-truth or, or post-factuality. We find this very exciting right now, this whole post-truth business. We associate it with the internet, or maybe we associate it with French theorists. And when we think of French theorists, we think of French cafes. And when we think of French cafes, we think of baguettes. And we think of baguettes, we think of hot chocolate. And it all seems you know, harmless or at least interesting. Um, when we think of post-truth, we should in fact think of fascism. We've been here before. The idea that the narrow empirical facts don't matter, the idea that you should abandon the principle of non-contradiction, the notion that what really matters is a myth which somehow brings everything together into a whole, the idea that there's a vision and that the leader is a visionary, that's fascism. That's the fascist epistemic. We've seen it before. That is what post-truth is. Post-truth is pre-fascism, which is a grim thought, I know, but it, if you recognize it for what it is, then you have some chance of isolating it and mounting your defenses uh, against it. Um, let me give you one more very practical lesson from, from the past. There are many more, but I'm just going to give you a, a practical one, which is um, an event that you know we all, I'm sure, have some sense of, the Reichstag fire. Right? Who set the Reichstag fire? I'm not asking you to raise your hands the way that Casper did. <laughs> Because I, I know none of you did it. Um, who, who, who? But you know. But his, 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 his. his well, actually, I'm kind of thinking you. You're looking guilty. Um, the, the, so, um, who, who set the Reichstag fire? We don't know. Actually, his, there's a historical debate which is actually turning again. Right? We don't know. But it doesn't matter. What, what, what the historical lesson of the Reichstag fire is that a major act of terrorism can become a justification for regime change, right? I mean, Hitler won election, narrowly won elections with a minority of votes in a failing democratic system. But the thing that transformed his electoral victory into the Nazi order was the management of terror, right? The management of terror. There will be acts of terror, right? There will be acts of terror on the territory of the United States. There will be acts of territory in Europe. The question is how leaders react and then how people react to leaders. I would be, I'm going to be very surprised if there are no acts of terrorism on the United States in the next few years or months or weeks. I, I would be very surprised if we know for sure who committed them. And I'll be very surprised if our president doesn't blame you know, the left or the Muslims, regardless of what the evidence is. And it seems pretty likely to me that he will use the occasion to declare some kind of state of emergency, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, we know from history that that's how it can happen but also that it doesn't have to happen that way, right? If there is an act of terror in the United States, Americans can say something else. They can say, it was your job to prevent that, Mr. President, and we would like to keep our freedoms just the way that we have them. But we can only have that reaction if we're aware of the historical example. 
Otherwise, we'll be overwhelmed by grief and by shock and by other emotions. Oh, and let me be really specific now about the European lesson, because I just want to make sure this gets across. Um, the specific lesson for Europeans, or one of them from the past, is you don't actually have a nation state to go back to. Right? I guess I probably already made that clear. But if you, look, if you look at the 1920s and 30s, you will realize either you had an empire, in your case, or you had a spectacular failure of a nation state, which was about to be removed from the map by Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. That's, those are your choices. <laughs> Um, for almost all Europeans. So that is the lesson of the 1920s and 1930s. If you want to look at them, right, you don't, there, there isn't actually that thing to go back to. You can get rid of Europe, right? I can't stop you, um, you know, much as I'd like to. I can't stop you from doing it. But you should realize that you're not going back to anything because there's nothing to go back to, right? This, the, the, this, the, the, this, the populist nostalgia, you know, it's not the past. It, it doesn't actually refer to anything. It's just fuzziness. It's just fuzziness and vagueness and ultimately nothing at all. But the, the final historical lesson, which, which I've been aiming at the entire time, you know, is, is what's going to seem like a very small one, but I think is actually the biggest one, the biggest one possible. And it goes back to, it goes back to, to, to the Havel quotation, actually, which I don't know if you were here when the Havel quotation was up, but I found it interesting that like, when you translate into English, it gets 50% longer, and then you translate into Dutch, it gets 100%. <laughs> longer. Um, but what, he was, what Havel was actually trying to say was rather, you know, rather simple and elegant, um, and it has to do with personal responsibility. So history, you know, hi history isn't finally about grand, grand stories, right? The grand stories are the temptations of inevitability of, and, and of eternity, those, those grand stories. And the thing about those grand stories, both of them, is that they totally relieve you from responsibility. Right? If liberal democracy or ever closer union or whatever, are, or the nation, if it's inevitable, then it doesn't really matter what you do, it's inevitable. Or similarly, if, if, if the past, present, and future are nothing but a series of cyclical conflicts with a hostile outside world, there's nothing you can do. You don't have any part in that. That's an overwhelming story. It's an overwhelming narrative. The, the, what, those things, what those stories ultimately do is they deprive you of responsibility. What, what history does um, is that it, 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 it brings back responsibility. Not responsibility for everything. That would be ridiculous. But responsibility for something. Or to put it a different way, if you, if you, if you understand the structure of a moment, that means you see the limits of the moment, but you also see the, the possibilities. If you, if, you, if you see a moment as a historical moment, then you see yourself as its co-creator, right? A small co-creator, perhaps, but nevertheless as its, as its co-creator. Um, it, it, it means that you know, all of our choices, this is a very simple thing, it's also very, it's very much like what Havel said, all of our choices matter quite a lot, including our intellectual choices. So, I mean, you, so you, you've gotten the, the initial thesis of what I'm saying. Our intellectual choice to accept these ideas of inevitability after 1989 had costs. If we choose to shift to an idea of, of an, an idea of eternity, just to be very clear, the idea offered us by fascists, the far right, national populists, if we choose to shift from inevitability to eternity, we'll be making another intellectual mistake, which will have even greater causes. We might not be able to stop or turn larger trends, but we can take responsibility for ourselves. And, and one little way to start doing that is by, I think, starting to think more historically. Thanks for your patience.